Dr. Magro is the Director of Dermatopathology and Professor of uh, Dermatology and Pathology, and is going to give you an overview of inflammatory skin diseases. Yes, thank you very much. So it's going to be a real uh, whirlwind um, to or a bird's eye view of inflammatory skin disease in uh, 30 minutes or less. <laughs> so, um, so basically, we're going to review a few sort of classic inflammatory skin diseases affecting the epidermis, dermis, and um, the subcutis. And just, you know, uh, we'll briefly touch uh, upon um, a variety of um, interesting entities. Um, and we'll move directly into um, a brief consideration of the um, sort of classic hypersensitivity reactions. When I think of inflammatory skin disease, many of the um, cutaneous reactions that we see actually can be linked with one of the classic uh, Gell and Coombs hypersensitivity reactions that I'm sure that you're all uh, familiar with. And so for the sake of time, I won't read them off the slide. I'll trust that you all more or less know what they, what they are. Um, so we'll focus first on um, inflammatory reactions that basically affect the epidermis, where the brunt of the inflammatory response is the epidermis. Um, and we'll um, start with um, eczema. Eczema is sort of a, a very uh, classic and common inflammatory dermatosis. And I believe Dr. Zippen already this morning uh, spoke to you about um, eczema. Um, there are really two common forms of eczema. Oh, tomorrow. tomorrow, okay. On Friday, tomorrow. yes. Oh, I see, okay. So you will talk, uh, I guess the eczema will be addressed at some point, uh, I guess on Friday. Um, there are two primary forms. Um, there's uh, an eczematoid uh, allergic form of eczema, and then the, the other is atopic eczema. For the purposes of this discussion, we'll just focus briefly on um, the allergic uh, form of eczematous dermatitis. And basically, with an allergic eczematous reaction, we have an antigen. And that antigen can be, it's typically a contactant, but sometimes it can be a drug where the patient ingests a drug that cross-reacts with something that they may have been sensitized to topically, so you actually end up with an eczematous drug reaction, which is you know, quite interesting. So you know, the essence of an eczematoid hypersensitivity reaction related to an allergen involves um, exposure of the skin to a topical um, allergen, um, evoking a um, clonally restricted T cell immune response to that allergen. Um, those sensitized T cells migrate back to the lymph node. And then with re-exposure to the allergen, the lymphocytes will migrate to the skin where that contactant exposure occurs and basically elicit um, what we see clinically and histologically as an allergic eczematous dermatitis. So here is a classic situation where you have poison ivy. I'm sure that many of you have had poison ivy. I used to always get it as a child. And um, the uh, clinical lesion will be this uh, sort of vesicular weeping reaction. And this is an idiosyncratic response where that person will develop an allergic response to that particular allergen, which is the, which is the poison ivy, poison oak. And so what do we see histologically under the microscope? Basically, when we see eczema under the microscope, what it reflects is a migration of those um, lymphocytes that are these clonally restricted lymphocytes that are responding to the allergen that is being presented to the T cells with um, Langerhan cells, and they're migrating up into the epidermis. And because of various cytokines elaborated by those lymphocytes, you get um, intracellular edema of the epidermis um, with frank vesiculation, uh, where you have an accumulation of uh, plasma and inflammatory cells that will translate clinically into those weeping uh, bullous lesions that you see from a clinical perspective. Um, so now we'll move on to, and that, by the way, is a classic Gell and Coombs type 4 hypersensitivity reaction, the delayed type. So now we'll move into another interesting epidermal reaction pattern that is immunologically mediated, and that's uh, another form of type 4 hypersensitivity. But instead of being of the delayed type, which, of course, eczema is, um, it's of the cytotoxic type 4 um, type. And um, with this, we'll consider um, erythromaltoforme and sort of the severe variants of erythromaltoforme, Stevens-Johnson syndrome, and toxic epidermal necrolysis. 
So in erythema multiforme, um, basically we have um, a, an antigen um, that um, is usually, it could be ingested like a drug or it could be related to an infection. And somehow, either through molecular mimicry or by binding to the keratinocyte, the keratinocyte is rendered antigenic and elicits this very specific cytotoxic CD8 mediated type 4 immune reaction. And the commonest antigenic triggers are microbial agents, for example, um, herpes simplex, but also drugs. Drugs can cause erythromultiforme, and rarely contactants. Um, and so here we have a patient who has herpes of the lips, so, so it's basically herpes labialis. And every time this person develops herpes labialis, the um, patient develops these targetoid lesions on the palms, which represent erythema multiforme. So somehow the herpes, maybe through molecular mimicry, um, renders the keratinocyte antigenic, and you get this migration of CD8 T cells into the epidermis, really attacking the epidermal keratinocytes. Um, and that is the essence of what we see under the microscope in um, erythema multiforme, which of course are these targetoid lesions on the palms. And here you can see lymphocytes really in intimate opposition to the necrotic keratinocytes representing the classic cytotoxic type 4 immune response. Now, there are very severe sort of forms of this cytotoxic type 4 immune response that's triggered by an exogenous antigen, specifically a drug. Um, referred to as Stevens-Johnson syndrome and toxic epidermonecrolysis. And if I'm not mistaken, Dr. Miskowski, I believe Dr. Harp will be addressing these two very severe conditions in much greater detail. But basically, in Stevens-Johnson syndrome, we have this cytotoxic immune reaction um, targeting the epithelium, whereby the brunt of the injury is actually a mucosal injury. So these patients have a severe mucositis with involvement of the conjunctiva and the mouth, and they can have some skin lesions that look like erythromultiforme. Now, the other form is toxic epidermal necrolysis, and here the brunt of the injury is the skin, but the skin is extensively damaged. Um, there is broad sheets of skin that are sloughed off. Um, and typically, more than 30% of the entire skin surface is sloughed off in toxic epidermal necrolysis. And so here you have an example of a patient who has this diffuse erythema with the sloughing off of the skin. And interestingly, there are some background lesions that are erythromultiforme-like, but really this patient has um, uh, more of a toxic epidermal necrolysis-like picture. Um, and what one sees under the microscope is similar to what we see in erythromultiforme, except the degree of lymphocyte infiltration of the epidermis is much less. So somehow this dysregulated and excessive keratinocyte apoptosis and necrosis occurs independent of any in vivo lymphocytes. And that actually relates to probably, and this is speculation, but probably circulating CD8 T cells in the bloodstream that are responding to the drug haptin are elaborating FAS ligand and binding to FAS on keratinocytes and causing this massive dysregulated uh, keratinocyte necrosis. Um, so I'll just um, move on to um, the next topic, just for the sake of time, because we only have 30 minutes here, um, psoriasis. So Dr. Wildman gave you a very excellent talk on psoriasis and had that uh, uh, really wonderful uh, patient presentation. And as the, you know, as the patient mentioned, it is a fairly common dermatosis. Um, it basically affects 1% of the population. Um, the, the classic type of psoriasis, of course, is psoriasis uh, vulgaris, where you have this predilection for the psoriasis to involve the um, you know, elbows and the knees. Um, but of course, we can see other types of psoriasis. Sometimes the patients can become entirely red, and I'm sure Dr. Wildman discussed this, erythrodermic psoriasis. Uh, at times, it can be a, a very striking pustular reaction on the palms and soles, referred to as pustular uh, psoriasis. 
And so here we have a you know, classic example of psoriasis vulgaris here, the scaly sort of patches on the knee. And this is another variant, which is pustular psoriasis. Um, these other forms, I'm sure, have been mentioned. For example, guttate psoriasis, that's quite interesting. It's an eruptive form of psoriasis that occurs when a patient has streptococcal pharyngitis. Um, and so what do we see under the microscope in um, sort of classic psoriasis? Well, as we'll discuss, this is an autoimmune reaction mediated by T cells, interestingly, um, where you have a combination of inflammation and epidermal proliferation. So the epidermis is hyperplastic, um, but at the same time, you do see these areas in the biopsy where the epithelium is quite thin, and that is because even though psoriasis evokes this epithelial hyperplasia, because it is a T cell reaction targeting keratinocytes, the keratinocytes are damaged as well. So there is some thinning of the epidermis, paradoxically. Um, there are inflammatory cells, and the inception of psoriasis will be a lymphocytic infiltrate, a T cell infiltrate, um, migrating into the suprapapillary plates. But because of the cytokine milieu, which is sort of rich in IL-17, you'll get a lot of neutrophils at some point in the temporal evolution of psoriasis. And so here, we can actually see the classic pattern of neutrophils within the stratum corneum. So as I was mentioning, it is a Th1 autoimmune disease. And these Th1 cells include Th17 cells that elaborate IL-17. And IL-17 is a potent neutrophil chemoattractant, and hence a very integral feature of psoriasis is the neutrophil. And of course, in extreme clinical uh, variants, we get the neutrophil actually grossly visible in the terms of pustulation. Um, now, in terms of the autoimmune reaction targeting the keratinocytes, the, keratin the keratins in psoriasis include an overexpression of keratins 6 and 17. And curiously, streptococcal antigen uh, actually has molecular mimicry with keratin 6 and 17, hence the association and the trigger of streptococcus in some cases of psoriasis, particularly the eruptive guttate variant. Um, so now we'll move on to another type of epidermal reaction pattern. Um, so, you know, the ones that we've considered to date are these type 4 reactions. For example, psoriasis is another type 4 immune response. Here we're going to talk about lupus erythematosus. Many connective tissue disease syndromes do manifest in the skin. Um, and the classic, of course, is lupus. And I, I'm not sure, Dr. Moskowski, I, I think when your talk on uh, cutaneous manifestations of internal disease, I wasn't sure if you'll be mentioning lupus. But... Um, we do have three variants of lupus. We have systemic lupus. We have a cutaneous, confined uh, form of lupus, referred to as subacute lupus. And then finally, another type of skin-confined lupus, but with a lot of scarring called discoid lupus. So here we have a classic picture of systemic lupus. The patient has this typical malar erythema. And also, the patient has these other skin lesions in this photo distribution. One of the hallmarks of all forms of lupus, systemic, subacute lupus, and discoid lupus, is the fact that this rash is photo distributed. And here we have a patient that has the malar rash of systemic lupus, but happens to have these ulcerative scarring lesions on the lip. Most patients with discoid lupus, um, which is a scarring form of lupus involving the head and neck area, typically don't have systemic lupus. I have seen a couple of cases where, in fact, they, they can have concomitant SLE. Um, this is the typical annular polycyclic photodistributed rash we see in subacute lupus. Um, and even though these patients have this extensive skin rash, they do not have any systemic symptomatology, which is in contradistinction to uh, systemic lupus, where, of course, the patients have a myriad of extracutaneous manifestations. And so regardless of the type of lupus, what we see under the microscope is an, what we call an interface dermatitis. We see lymphocytes in the epidermis and damaging the epidermis. But unlike what I showed you with um, psoriasis and uh, erythromaltiforme, 
Here, the, the lymphocytes are actually there because of antibody-dependent cellular immunity. So in point of fact, when the skin is exposed to sunlight, it becomes antigenic in lupus patients, and they develop an antibody response to the keratinocyte that has been altered by sun exposure, and the T cells end up in the epidermis because they bind to the antibody through FC receptors. That's the concept of antibody-dependent uh, cellular immunity. Also, when you have the antibody attacking the epidermis, which becomes antigenic with light exposure, we activate complement, and we generate the membrana membranolytic attack complex, C5B-9, and that, too, contributes to the epidermal injury, basically. So again, lupus erythematosus is a classic example, antibody-dependent cellular immunity. Our target cell is the keratinocyte. It becomes antigenic with light exposure. You have an antibody binding to the keratinocyte, and then the T cells are there kind of secondarily. Um, now we're going to talk about autoimmune vesicular bolus disorders. Now this is also a type 2 immune reaction where you have antibodies attacking the epidermis. Um, and the two broad categories of, um, of autoimmune vesicular bolus disease that we'll consider today are pemphigus and pemphigoid, um, as well as dermatitis epidermis, which um, is a, a different type of autoimmune vesicular bolus disorder likely related to an Arthas type 3 immune complex reaction. So let's look at bolus pemphigoid. So in bolus pemphigoid, we um, see it as a disease primarily of elderly patients, but in fact it can occur in all age groups. And these patients will present with these large, tense bulla. Um, the lesions are intensely pyritic. What does one see under the microscope? Basically, there is an epidermal dermal separation. So something has happened whereby the epidermal basement membrane zone is disrupted. And it has been disrupted by an antibody of IgG isotype. Somehow um, there is an antibody that recognizes the epidermal basement membrane zone as antigenic and evokes this attack on the basement membrane zone, resulting in this blister. And one of the characteristic hallmarks of bullous pemphigoid is prominent tissue eosinophilia. So when you look at the blisters of BP, they have a lot of eosinophils. And what do we see? Well, there is a test that we do. It's called a direct immunofluorescence. It requires doing a skin biopsy and putting into a special fixative called Michelle's fixative. And then we take fluorescine dyed antibodies targeting human immunoglobulin. And we look under the microscope, and we assess for the presence or absence of this linear staining pattern for IgG, which is basically highlighting the epidermal basement membrane zone. And we can see it's a very striking linear staining pattern that indicates that this patient has an antibody of IgG isotype targeting the epidermal basement membrane zone consistent with bullous pemphigoid. And the antigenic epitopes are um, varied, but they're primarily um, these two. And bullous pemphigoid antigen 1 and 2 are normal constituents in all of us of the basement membrane zone. So these patients have antibodies to it to result in this uh, blistering eruption. So now let's talk about um, pemphigus. So pemphigus is another autoimmune vesicular bullous disorder. And here, the, um, the antibodies are targeting what keeps the keratinocytes together, so the intercellular proteins. Um, and we have two main types of pemphigus. We have a deep form of pemphigus that prior to the advent of immunosuppressive therapy was lethal, pemphigus vulgaris. And then we have a superficial form of pemphigus, um, which is referred to as pemphigus foliaceous. So here, we have the epidermis, and you can see how the top layer of the epidermis is falling apart. That's referred to as acantholysis. So we have this superficial acantholytic reaction that is characteristic for superficial pemphigus, also referred to as pemphigus foliaceous. Now, this is the 
deep form of pemphigus, where the acantholysis, the falling apart of the keratinocytes, is really involving the lower portion of the epidermis. Um, and that leads to severe sloughing of the skin. And that is why in the old days, before it was recognized to be an autoimmune condition, um, patients would die from this disease because they would lose so much of their skin. Um, and here we have um, an antibody that's targeting a different protein than the antibody that targets the sort of benign superficial variant that we call pemphigus foliaceus. So this is a cartoon depiction of the intercellular junction. And basically in pemphigus, antibodies are formed against the intercellular junction and there are various antigenic epitopes in this junction. In pemphigus foliaceus, the antigenic epitope is desmoglein 1, which is concentrated more superficially in the epidermis. In pemphigus vulgaris, it's desmoglein 3, um, which is going to be very rich in the lower part of the epidermis. And when we do direct immunofluorescence, sure enough, we see this chicken wire pattern where we have intercellular uh, staining of the epidermis reflecting this gel and Coombs type 2 immune reaction targeting the uh, intercellular junction. And this is a uh, clinical presentation of pemphigus foliaceus where the differential diagnosis clinically might encompass seborrheic dermatitis, um, but it is not, even though it'll be a bothersome rash, because the acantholysis is so superficial, patients do not die from it. In contradistinction in pemphigus vulgaris, that's quite a different scenario. And it should also be emphasized that desmoglein 3, which is the main antigen in pemphigus foliaceus, is very rich in the oral cavity. And as a consequence, it is characteristic for patients with pemphigus vulgaris to have oral lesions. Dermatitis epitiformis is a very interesting eruption. Um, it's a very itchy skin rash where there is this typical symmetrical involvement of the elbows, knees, ba back of the neck. Um, and there is a very strong association with gluten sensitive enteropathy. Um, this is a clinical depiction of dermatitis epitiformis. And uh, here, what we see under the microscope in one of these lesions are a lot of neutrophils, neutrophils in the epidermis and neutrophils forming abscesses within the dermal papillae. And what we see by immunofluorescence is quite interesting. It's a granular deposition pattern of IgA in the dermal papillae. IgA is a potent neutrophilic chemoattractant, hence all the neutrophils. And unlike bullous pemphigoid and pemphigus vulgaris, where it's an antibody attacking the epidermis, a gel and Coombs type 2 immune reaction, in dermatitis epitiformis, it's actually immune complex driven where the immune complex is IgA antibody bound to epidermal transglutaminase. And it just so happens that these patients typically have gluten-sensitive enteropathy. Now we'll talk about um, two dermal reaction patterns. Um, there's a lot of inflammatory conditions that affect the dermis, and I'm only going to choose two out of many. Um, the classic uh, vasculitis that we see in the skin is leukocytoclastic vasculitis. It will manifest as palpable purpura. Um, and this would be a typical clinical presentation, which is um, fixed, non-blanchable, palpable purpura. Um, and what does one see under the microscope? Well, if you biopsy a classic leukocytoclastic vasculitis, you're going to see vascular injury. So you're going to see fibrin deposition within the vessel wall. Vascular compromise with red cell extravasation. And the main infiltrate is a neutrophil. And most typically, a leukocytoclastic vasculitis is an immune complex reaction. The immune complex is, it could be endogenous, such as in the setting of lupus, erythematosus, or it could be exogenous if the patient had a drug and they developed an immune reaction to the drug. But when you have an immune complex deposition, it activates complement generates neutrophilic chemoattractants, which attract the neutrophils, sorry, which leads to neutrophils migrating into the vessels and damaging the vessels. Urticaria, 
um, that um, there is a very interesting variant of urticaria called chronic idiopathic urticaria, where hives are observed for more than six weeks. And what's interesting in urticaria, here we have an urticarial plaque. Under the microscope, we see neutrophils and eosinophils. These patients will actually have antibodies of IgG isotype to the high affinity receptor for IgE on mast cells and produce these urticarial lesions. So in fact, it is a type 2 immune reaction that is associated with chronic urticaria, at least in 50% of cases. And then we'll conclude the talk with a brief consideration of paniculitis. Paniculitis is a very interesting type of inflammatory process affecting the fat and oftentimes is associated with a systemic disease. It's a manifestation um, uh, in many instances of something systemic. When you have this inflammatory response affecting the fat, and there's a whole host of paniculitic syndromes. There's a, in fact, there's an inflammatory course I give with my colleagues, and we have two hours devoted to paniculitis. It's such an interesting condition of varied types. And I'll give you a classic um, form of paniculitis called erythematodosum, where these lesions are typically seen on the anterior lower legs. They're very painful. Uh, there can be concomitant uh, symptoms like fever and arthralgias. And um, typically what it represents is a hypersensitivity reaction, the type 4 subtype, so a gel and Coombs type for immune reaction. And the trigger can be an infection, and it could be an occult infection. Um, it could also be a drug. There are two systemic diseases where you can see erythematodosum, sarcoid and Crohn's disease. Um, and what one sees clinically are painful erythematous plaques. And what does one see histologically? Well, remember, it's a type 4 hypersensitivity reaction. So it's a T cell driven reaction to some kind of an antigen. Um, so what one sees is a combination of T cells and histiocytes producing little granulomas in the septa of the fat. And I just wanted to end the talk with something that happened to me in the summer anecdotally. I, I personally, and I've signed out, you know, interpreted thousands of cases of paniculitis over the years, but I developed in the summer, in July, this extremely exquisitely painful lesion on the pretibial surfaces of my leg. It was so painful. Um, Dr. Granstein had looked at it, and I thought, he kind of looks like erythematodosum, but it's a solitary lesion. And he said, Cynthia, he goes, it sort of looks like unilesional erythematodosum. I've never really seen a case of it. And um, of course, I started to obsess about, oh my god, why do I have erythematodosum? I was relieved to you know, be aware of the fact that 60% of cases are idiopathic. The others are infection. I wasn't aware I had an infection. Uh, drug, I wasn't taking any drugs. But then there's a small percentage that are associated with malignancy. So of course, you know, I, I have the medical school student syndrome again, and I'm obsessing about this nonstop for weeks and weeks and weeks. This thing would not get any better. And then suddenly it went away. And it turns out that, and I'm going to be re revealing something about, I guess, my dental hygiene, but um, actually, it's actually very good, but I had an occult dental abscess. And here you can actually see the abscess around this tooth, which had a root canal in it, and the abscess was drained. Um, I'm now in the process of getting an implant, actually, and the erythematodosum went away. So it was an example of a um, paniculitic bacterid to this occult dental infection. And, um, and I thought that was pretty cool. And I would have to say that, you know, as doctors, and you are going to be coming doctors soon, the one thing that none of us want to end up as is an interesting case. And with that, I think I will stop my talk. I have one minute to spare for any questions. I was wondering for dermatitis hepatiformis, it says yes. the treatment is dapsone, which is an antibiotic. Why would you use that if it's, um, no, there are no microbes involved? Oh, well, yeah, so I think sometimes antibiotic, well, dapsone is, of course, the classic therapy because of its neutrophil chemotractant 
like it actually inhibits neutrophilic chemotaxis, but actually antibiotics, I suppose, also can have certain, is that what you're asking? Using antibiotics? Yeah, why is that a treatment for? Um, well, I guess antimicrobial agents actually can be very in, potent inhibitors of uh, inflammatory cell influxes. Even in the absence of? Even in the absence, yeah. Yeah. Well yeah. yeah. And, and um, a number of the sulfur drugs yes. are used Yes, and um, you know, and, and again, it's a fascinating disease, and uh, it's an, it's I think the most pruritic condition uh, known in, in in the old days when people did not know what it was. Patients had even committed suicide because of the pruritus. Um, but yeah. All right. Thank you.